born in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> Although you wouldn't know it by the way I speak now. I, I do revert to my Brooklyn accent occasionally, but not too often. Um, I, um, and we moved to, to Long Island when I was about five, so um, I really grew up in Long Island. And I uh, grew up in an Italian-American family. We had um, lots of pasta. Li <laughs> lived with my grandparents. My grandparents were a big influence on my life. They were with me all the time, practically. So um, it was really important uh, to have them with me as I was growing up. Uh, my grandfather, in particular, was very um, academically oriented. So he was, he was always encouraging to me in school. And um, so we grew up with a, with a very close family life, um, both my immediate family and then we had a lot of relatives in the area. So we'd get together with cousins and that kind of thing. So, um, and I still am close with a lot of them, which is nice, even though we've all kind of separated geographically. Um, but um, so my grandfather and uh, my mother, I guess, just to, to a large extent too, were always very encouraging school-wise with me. So I didn't grow up in a family of scholars. I was really the first in my family generation to go to college. And um, it was um, an interesting experience for me. I didn't have a lot of uh, people who could help me out to tell me what to do or how to apply or what to major in or what to do, any of that stuff. So um, I just went with my what I liked. And so when I was in high school, I was kind of a math geek. I liked to do math, and I was tracked I was going to be a math teacher. And then um, I got exposed to the sciences and really liked the biological and chemical sciences. And so when I went to college, I finally decided to major in biology. And, uh, and they didn't have a biochemistry major then, but that's what would have been my major. I had almost a dual major, and I was really into the Beatles when the Beatles came out. And, 1964, I was just a, still a little kid, and I was um, went crazy about that, over that with my friends. Um, I like to sing. I did a lot of singing in uh, school. Um, I was always involved in music. So my grandmother, as I said, we, I was always close to them. She insisted that I started taking piano lessons when I was six years old, and so I did. And so music was always a big part of my life. Um, and then I liked to sing as well, so I started singing in grade school and then uh, joined the glee club in high school. We, we sang in competitions and, and that kind of thing, and I sang all the way through college. Um, and I continued to play the piano, too. I wanted to. I never became, uh, I, it was always a classical, uh, focused on classical music, um, not so much the popular. Um, and I did, I guess I was pretty good at one point and um, continued to take lessons right through um, high school and college. And then I always say that that's my hobby that I'm going to go back to when I finally get some time to continue playing. But I really think that it had an effect on me in the sense of um, it's like riding a bicycle. When, you, um, when I go back to the piano, I can still sight read music and play, and not obviously not good as good as I was, but um, it's really something I know I can go back to because I still have the ear for it and I still love music, always love music. So my first exposure to science was my biology class in high school and I had a really great teacher and um, I just fell in love with that class and I, everything that I, I did in it you know, was interesting to me. And so um, every time I, this, this one teacher I had, every time she signed my um, yearbooks she'd always say, I look forward to seeing you a great scientist, Joanne. <laughs> so um, I always re remembered her. She, I mean, she had a big, obviously, she had a big influence on me and, as a, a biology person. And um, so I became interested in all sorts of biology things. She probably piqued um, an interest that was always in me but never had um, experienced before. So she made it really interesting. So learning about living things, you know, just fascinated me. And being able to, um, you know, whatever, I don't remember so much about the labs that we did, but it, it was, you know, hands-on things and being able to ask questions and answer them and um, just finding out it was fascinating to me how life was organized. And 
it just, it just, it just, I guess it was a sense of wonder that I had that all these things existed in the universe and they carried on the way they did and were able to function the way they did. And it still fascinates me when I think about the complexity of the universe, not just the life part of it, but just the extent of the universe and where that all is. It's, it's incomprehensible. So it just continues to fascinate, fascinate me. And when you went into college, it, did you say you were on track to be a math teacher, but you just changed your mind or by that time? By the time I got to college, I had pretty much decided not to do the math thing, that I wanted to go into the sciences. And then I thought if I majored in science, it would be a little bit difficult to do a science major and then do education at the same time. So I just decided to leave the education piece down. And then I got involved um, doing some research when I was in college, too. Um, in a lab, we worked in plants, of all things. Um, but it was interesting, and I was interested in the chemical pieces of it, so that's why, that's why my, my biochemical background um, was, um, I guess, encouraged in that, too. So well, let's talk a little bit about that first experience with research. Um, had you any idea what research was before then, or in high school, or no. never thought about it? No, never. I had, it was my, actually my botany teacher who said that there were some um, uh, opportunities to do research because there were a couple of professors. I was a very small school, so they, we didn't have a lot in the way of research, especially back in those days. Um, and um, so she presented this, more or less told me about a problem that they were working on. And I said, hmm, I wonder if you could ask this question or answer that question that way. And she said, well, you know, it sounds like you really should get involved in this. So my junior year in college, I started doing some work with, um, with antioxidants in plants. And it was really interesting to me. And then I finally got to take my first biochemistry class in, as, a, as a senior. And that, that was it. I knew that was where I wanted to go. I was thinking about it in terms of you, you, you have this scientific situation and you have an unknown that you're trying to figure out where it's going. And so you have to be able to think logically and ask the right questions. And then you have to be able to design an experiment appropriately so that you get um, an answer to your question that's going to be somewhat unambiguous. Of course, in reality, it doesn't turn out that way. And what I found out in, in dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis is that the answers never really come very easily, and there are always confounding factors in there. And so you always end up back at the drawing board to design a better experiment because you've overlooked something or you, and, um, something unforeseen uh, happened. You can never predict how science is going to go. And so that's, that's, that was the fascination, but also the frustration. Because you think you're asking a very simple question, and you think you're designing a way to come up with the answer to that question, and then all of a sudden, you know, you get a, a wrench thrown in the works, and so you have to go back to the drawing board. Um, and it, it didn't deter me from it. I said, "No, I'm going to go through, and I'm going to um, continue with this." I thought about going into medicine at one point, and then I thought, "Well, I'm not sure that's really what I want to do." Um, I took, took the MCATs and never really got around to applying to, to medical school. And I ended up applying to graduate school to go for, into a PhD program. And, um, but I was still interested in the medical side of things, so I went into a program that was going to get me involved in medical research. And so that's, that's how I ended up doing my career um, path choices. Well, you know, it was the 60s, and it was a time of change. A lot of things were going on socially. Um, I was very interested in what was happening with the Civil Rights Movement and the Vietnam War and um, social justice things. And those influenced me a lot when I was in high school. And 
thinking that I wanted to do something that was going to be for um, the good of society certainly had um, played a role in, in um, making me interested in, in the research aspect of things, wanting to help people in, in some way. That um, it was, it, it was an interesting time. Is you know people look back on it and they say it was really a troubled time, but I also remember it as being a very open time, very progressive time that people were really thinking outside the box in a lot of different ways, and I think that probably had a permanent effect on me because I've always been a little bit of a um, out of the box thinker. Um, a little bit on the progressive side um, in how I approach life. I'm certainly not fitting in with my family. It made it very difficult to fit in with some people in my family. I had, you know, I was much more of a, um, a broad thinker than, than I was brought up to be in, in that sense. So I my mother always said, well, I always wanted you to go to college, but then when you went to graduate school, I thought, no, now it's getting to be a little bit too much. <laughs> You're supposed to get married and have kids. <laughs> it's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> so um, she, I think even probably to this day, she's, she's still alive. Um, she, she thinks that she probably encouraged me a little bit too much in the education area. In the 70s, when I was in graduate school, um, I had the person who ended up being my PhD advisor was doing a lot of work with chemical carcinogenesis. And so cancer research was a big thing. It was Nixon's war on cancer that he had declared at the beginning of the 70s. And so there was a lot of money in research at the time, and it really interested me. How does cancer, how do chemicals cause cancer? And so I got involved in this. Um, this field and looking at um, how mutations are caused by chemicals and how they could ultimately lead to the development of cancer and um, it was it was fascinating. I got to meet all of these really interesting people in the fields, something that was so totally different than anything else I had been exposed to um, scientifically before. I mean I did my plant work in college but this was this was really big stuff. It was exciting. It was cutting edge, and um, I was doing work with Ben's pyrene, which in, at that time that was the carcinogen du jour, and um, everybody was doing work with Ben's pyrene, and I was doing metabolism studies, which was right in the biochemical piece of things that I really liked, and I got to develop some new um, uh, methods. Uh, at the time, it was HPLC was the chromatography method that was just coming out, and I got we couldn't afford to buy a big system, so I got to develop my own, working with um, you know bits and pieces here and there, and and was able to crank out my thesis using that, mm -hmm. and so um, so it was really interesting to me, and um, you know cancer is forty years later is still a big puzzle. As we see, it's um, it's not an easily solvable thing. But I think that we're finding out as we do about cancer, we're finding out more about ourselves because really, what cancer is is just how we end up going awry in our normal growth, and it's um, it's it's still fascinating to me how is, it happens. Is any of your work now based on or a continuation of the, your early? No, projects? no. Um, I morphed into, uh, from chemical carcinogenesis, I really began to focus more on the toxicology piece of it. And then when I came to um, Hopkins in 89 is when I um, really learned about this whole effort toward finding alternatives to toxicity testing. And that was a whole new world for me too. So I kept stepping out of my comfort zone and going into these areas that I'd never been in before. First of all, there has to be a distinction between animals for research and animals for testing. They're two different, very different things. Research is discovery. It's finding out new information about living systems, about disease, how diseases um, 
uh, are caused uh, and what we can do, how we can intervene in those diseases to cure them. Testing from an environmental perspective is a very standardized set of animal uh, tests that are done to show the level of toxicity of a chemical. So in the olden days, they would measure out um, doses of a chemical. Now these are chemicals that would be sold commercially. So just things that you find on the shelf, cleaning products, anything that could be um, purchased by the general public. There was um, an, uh, there's an obligation to let people know that these are toxic chemicals. And if you ingest them, then you have to do something about it called poison control or whatever. So how do we determine what the dose is that's, uh, or the amount is that's going to be toxic for a person? And that was always done in animals. So right from the beginning when they started testing chemicals in the eyes of rabbits, the Dray's test, to see if it was corrosive. And so if it was corrosive in a rabbit's eyes, you would assume that it's going to be corrosive for humans. Um, if you um, put something on an animal's skin and it caused a rash or it caused um, a, a, some kind of a bruise or something, you could pretty much assume that that would be the case for humans too. There was a test that was done um, typically that was uh, in animals that was called the LD50. And LD50 means lethal dose 50. So how much of a chemical would kill half of the animals? Pretty crude. So they would, you know, come up with the, the different doses of chemicals. They'd give it to the animals. And the dose that caused half of the animals to die was called the lethal dose 50, LD50. Well, it was still being done even 20 years ago. And that's changed. That isn't done anymore because it's a pretty crude way of, of measuring um, toxicity. So when I first became involved in toxicology, and a lot of toxicology is being done, um, you know, through companies that are selling chemicals um, and companies that are testing drugs for safety because that's also a piece of the toxicity side of things. Um, those were pretty standard types of tests. And things have really come a long way since then. So when I first started working at Johns Hopkins in 1989, and I became involved with the Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing about a year later, the LD50 was still being discussed and still being used. Um, but people were beginning to see that there's got to be a better way of doing this. So not only is it inhumane to the animals, because some of these things were pretty nasty chemicals, and I didn't know anything about that. Um, I had no no idea when I until I came to Hopkins what what was going on in what that. Was, what was your first experience with that? Your first knowledge of that? Well, it was before. Actually, it was before I came to to uh, to uh, Hopkins. I was at Dartmouth, and there were two people in our department who uh, wrote a book on toxicity of chemicals. And I remember, you know, hearing them talk about this book, and it was a really big deal for them. And they, I heard them talking about some experiments where they were pouring sodium hydroxide, or lye, down a rabbit's throat to see what happened. And that was part of the toxicity assessment. And I remember being horrified about that, because everybody knows lye is corrosive. Why would, why would you have to test it in an animal? Um, and then when I came to Hopkins and then I realized that it wasn't just things like lye, but there were all, all of these this whole other world of chemicals that was being tested that really caused a lot of harm, um, 
it, it made me really think about, yeah, there is a need to find a better way to do this. There's got to be a way to, to understand how these chemicals are working um, so that you can really get a handle on the, the mechanism of it without just doing these crude tests. And things were starting to happen in the 80s. Um, people were beginning to look at it, certainly in the area of cosmetic testing. That was an area w which was considered to be a low-hanging fruit because, you know, cosmetics are typically not very dangerous anyway. And they're, they're pretty frivolous in the sense of, do you really need to kill an animal to see if having a new um, type of makeup is, is going to be safe? And it, it's an ethical issue. Sure it is. Um, when it gets down to chemicals, it's a little bit different because you see that there are millions of, well, not millions, but there are thousands of chemicals on the market that have never been tested. And because it's pra practically impossible, you can't go through all the different animal tests that are now prescribed for, um, for chemical safety testing and come up with an answer in this century even. It's just, it's just ridiculous. And a good example of, of a chemical that hadn't been tested is the one that was released in the river in um, West Virginia just a few months ago. And nobody knew anything about that chemical because it had never been tested. So nobody could come up and say, well, these are the toxic effects that you could see. This is the toxic level that you can be exposed to without um, seeing any uh, at danger, couldn't tell it with that. It was a perfect example. So from a practical sense, as well as from uh, a humane sense, we need to come up with better ways of assessing toxicity of chemicals and what to do about them. And so what, are, what do some of these processes, these new processes look like? Well, there is a test that was marketed I think probably back in the 90s, for corrosion. It's called Corositex. And it was just a simple chemical reaction where you could put um, a chemical in to this mix and you could get a reading from it and it would tell you yay or nay, chemicals to uh, corrosive or not. The, the really corrosive stuff it really isn't hard to tell. It's, you know, you, could, you, you don't have to go very far to figure that out. It's the stuff that's in the middle that's always the, the, the difficult ones to, to get to. But this test was approved and it, and it is used um, uh, routinely for chemicals in commerce so that when you have these big trucks on the road big tanker trucks and you see these signs on them that say corrosive, people know they're corrosive. So if there's a spill, they know how to handle it. Um, so we haven't come as far as we'd like to come in the sense of really having good ways of, of testing all of these chemicals. There have been some major advances made um, looking at um, cell-based tests that have various endpoints. So knowing how a chemical works and knowing what the endpoint is um, can give a clue as to whether it's going to be toxic in a human or not. And the Environmental Protection Agency has really come a long way in their development of these automated systems where they can test thousands and thousands of chemicals in hundreds of tests with different endpoints and be able to come out with a reasonable prediction of whether something is going to be toxic or not. That's called ToxCast, the ToxCast program. Mm -hmm. And that's, you could go to their website and find it and it's, it's really quite interesting. All of this geared towards not having to test on animals or it's, it's additional information. I mean, at some point you have to see if that's actually, you might have to, do you have to try to an animal at some point to see if they're valid or what does that look like? <laughs> yeah, it's not easy. It's very complicated because even if you said that a cell test system is giving you appropriate data, 
if you're getting the same results as you'd get in an animal test, that may or may not be correct because you're not testing it in a human, which is what your bottom line is. And so we're moving to using human cell lines and human systems. Um, and the gold standard is the human. I mean, the best way to find out if, if a chemical is toxic in humans is to have human data. And there are instances where that, that's happened in where there are chemical spills that um, we've been able to do the epidemiology on those studies and have been able to show that these chemicals at these doses are toxic for humans. And that's why even now when you look at the, uh, at the list of chemical carcinogens, going back to the cancer thing, there are an, any number of, and I'm not going to know all the numbers for this, but there are all kinds of chemicals that have shown to be, um, been shown to be carcinogenic in animals, but only a handful that have been shown to be carcinogenic in humans because you can't do the study in humans unless you have an accidental exposure. So you might say that this is a potential human carcinogen, but you can't say for sure. Um, and well, cancer, again, as we discussed earlier, is a, is a very complicated story. We can get exposed to very small, minute quantities of something at a very early age and not even know we were exposed to it. We could develop cancer 20 years down the road and never be able to say it was because I was exposed to X, Y, and Z. I, you know, I have a personal um, experience in that. My husband has a very rare um, blood disorder. And... He thinks, well, I used to like to work in gas stations when I was a kid. Maybe it was the exposure to the benzene when I was working in these gas stations that caused this. Um, but there's no way of knowing for sure. We do need to go into the research piece of it, and that's, um, and that's the idea of using animals as models to study human disease, and that's how they're used now. And people do studies on animals because they think that um, or they have evidence to believe that the way um, diseases are caused in animals is similar to the way diseases are caused in humans. Except that we're finding out that that's not always the case. It's not 100% true because humans are not rats or mice. And things happen in rats and mice that, are, uh, that don't occur in humans and vice versa. So we tend to say, well, let's go to a species that's closer to humans, like monkeys. Um, and to some extent, that may be true, because they certainly are closer to us. But um, there's a great, great example of that where that wasn't true was um, chimps and HIV. So chimps were, um, when, when the HIV epidemic started in the 80s, um, many chimps were infected with HIV, but they never developed AIDS. That's because they were not, they did not progress in the disease the same way that humans did. So they were carriers of HIV. They had, they were infected with it, but it, they never developed AIDS. Later, it was found out that um, macaques and only a very um, small genetic um, background of macaques developed HIV uh, AIDS the way humans do. And so those animals were used. But the, the fallacy that if you went to the human's closest relative to study a disease didn't work, didn't pan out in that case. In other cases, it's true. I mean, this, the whole big um, <clears throat> um, controversy about chimps and research that, was, that came up a couple of years ago, one of the diseases that has been studied in chimps, because it is one of the few species that gets it, is hepatitis C. And so um, chimps were, were used to develop a vaccine for hep C. Um, now, as it turns out, um, we can genetically engineer mice to become infected with hep C, so we can use them. They, they have humanized livers. Normally, mice are not ex, uh, uh, infected with hepatitis C virus, but you can genetically manipulate the mice so that they um, have human aspects in their liver cells so that they are infected with hepatitis C virus. 
so you can use them to study the progression of the disease and not use chimps. I mean, chimps are, it, it's really impractical to use chimps um, from a cost perspective, um, the fact that they're endangered, and just simply from an ethical perspective. Um, they are our close relatives, and so we wonder, you know, they might resemble us in too many ways. Mm -hmm. And I think people like Jane Goodall and others who have studied behavior of, of chimps can attest to the fact that they really do have um, inner lives and societies and behaviors that really question the idea of whether we should use them for research purposes. So that's a little bit off topic. It's something I do want to get into at some point because it's very Im important to me. Uh, <clears throat> but the research piece, I think where we're coming now in the research community is really understanding what the right model is. Just because a mouse gets a disease doesn't mean it's the best model to study human disease. And it may be that there's there's another animal model out there. No, a woodchuck isn't a lab animal, but it's it's a, an animal in which hepatitis C occurs naturally and then un, ended up being a really good model for studying human hepatitis B because it progressed in a similar manner in woodchucks the way it progresses in humans. And now there's a big push for using naturally occurring diseases in animals to study human disease, particularly companion animals. And that's a big soapbox of mine because I really think that there's a tremendous potential for studying animals. There are millions, literally millions, of companion animals out there. And um, dogs, dogs in particular, I think they're typically a better model for, for most diseases for humans than cats are, but um, cat, cats are to some extent too. So dogs develop certain types of cancers, they develop certain chronic diseases, um, and now we're taking such great care of our pets. They're living longer, so they're developing cancer. And the veterinarians out there, I think, need to be in tune to what's going on in their companion animal clientele, that I think there could, there's really room for um, epidemiologists and other scientists to um, mine that huge um, data field for information about naturally occurring diseases. And I think people are beginning to realize this, and the veterinary schools are coming up with clinics where they can um, ask people to bring in their client, their animals t uh, to be studied um, that could be, uh, that their data could be incorporated in, and uh, included in re uh, relating it to human research. And I think that's, that's really up and coming. I think that's tremendous uh, focus for the future. Not to mention the, you know, if you get public health people at it and the epidemiology types who could go out there and begin to look at the data and even as far as um, environmental exposures. We don't think about that, but our animals are exposed to the same things that we are. And so are they developing more cancers in a certain field if they're drinking the same water that we are? Um, they're certainly the developing the same metabolic diseases that we are. Uh, the number of animals now that are coming into the clinics that are obese, dogs and cats, developing type 2 diabetes. They have all these metabolic diseases that we're getting, and they live in the same environments that we do. Is it only because of that we're overfeeding them, or is it something else that's affecting them? I mean, people are looking now at the um, gut bacteria, 20 million bacterial genes compared to 20,000 human genes that are expressed. So, you know, add that to the complex mix <laughs> So it's, we're not just producing our own stuff, but we got these billions of bacteria, trillions of bacteria that are also um, contributing to what we are doing and how we progress health-wise. So our companion animals are also going to have the same complications. And so it's just, 
And, that, and that's what I mean about this fascination with the complexity of human life. So even if you think you're getting to the bottom of something in understanding how something works, then all of a sudden they come up with this, the, the, the microbiome. And now it's not just human cells we're dealing with, but all these bacteria. It's just, it's, it's just mind boggling when you think about it. It's so complicated. So um, I think that um, getting back to the whole animals and research thing, I think that there's a tremendous amount of information that can be gleaned from um, our own animals out there that could contribute to the study of human disease. And the, um, it, it's, the, the field is moving, I think, in that direction. In fact, there's this concept of one one health, one medicine that um, is gaining traction to get the veterinary community and the medical, human medical community to talk to one another because there's probably a lot of information that's been missed because they've been going in parallel tracks for so long that they need to be integrating what they know. And I think it'll help on both sides of things. Well, my main focus in the animal world right now is on animal welfare. And so I work for the Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing. And alternatives, it's probably somewhat of a misnomer in the sense of alternatives people usually think, if not one, then the other. And back in the 70s, when the term alternatives was coined uh, in, the, in, the, in the area of animal research. It was really meant to encompass what we call the three R's, reduction, refinement, replacement. So when people hear that you're from the alter Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing, they think that you're only looking at replacement alternatives. I have not been in the lab for quite a long time. I've not been doing um, bench research um, I started to become interested in public communication of science, having the public understand why we do science and why, it, uh, let's see, um, understanding the animal research controversy to me, I had to back up and say it's not because people don't understand animal research, they don't understand science. And back in the 90s when I was working with CAT, I was doing a lot of work with outreach to students, um, explaining what the three R's were, what the scientific process uh, is, how it works. Um, and the part that animal research plays in the whole scheme of things. It's not that all research is done on animals. Some research is done on animals. It's part of a whole um, plethora of methods that we have to ask research questions. So when I left CAT in 19, no, in 2000, I became the director of ILAR at the National Academy of Sciences. So ILAR is the Institute for Laboratory Animal Research. I became, I was on ILAR Council as, on their advisory board as an alternatives person um, in 1998 and 1999. And then when the position opened up to become director of ILAR, I applied for it. So a lot of my focus in the 90s was in vitro methods and toxicity testing, which that was my scientific background. That's where I was. When I came to ILAR, it was like this whole new world opened to me. I guess that's not the first time I've said that in this interview. I really became involved in animals, per se, animals, animal welfare, and how animals were used in research, guidelines for using animals in research. So as part of ILAR, we were the ones who, ILAR is the one that writes the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals. 
I had this huge learning curve realizing that in all the years that I had been doing my chemical carcinogenesis work, even though I had worked in rats and um, doing all my in vitro studies, that I really didn't know very much about animals. And the, the lab species and how they were used and all of a sudden realizing that these were animals that had inner lives that deserved consideration from a moral and ethical perspective, but also from a scientific perspective. Because if we're using them to study scientific questions, we, needed, we need the animals to be a good model. That was a, a revelation to me. So if animals are being used and they're kept under conditions where they're stressed, um, or um, they're not allowed to exhibit their normal behaviors that they would exhibit in the wild, or at least some semblance of that, we can't give them the wild, but they're not going to be good research subjects. And the answers that we get from them are going to be faulty. And that was, you know, a whole new world for me, opening up, thinking about the concept of animal welfare. So the idea that animals might be experiencing pain or distress in, in a laboratory situation, or that they might not be able to um, be what they are programmed to be in a behavioral sense is going to affect their whole physiological being. And then I started thinking back on some work that um, I was exposed to back in undergraduate days, because um, in that, at that time, the Nobel Prize was given to um, Conrad Lorenz and Nicola uh, Tinbergen for animal behavior stuff. And I had that, I studied that in my bioethics class when I was in college. And all of a sudden, it all came back to me, and I said, this is really, really interesting to understand the behavior of animals. What, from, first of all, from the perspective of what their needs were in a laboratory, that was my, my initial interest. But then it became broader than that. I never really questioned the fact that I ever needed to use animals for what I was doing in my research. But I did question the fact that I didn't give them the kind of consideration that I should have. And that was, I mean, when I started, it was before Iacux, it was before any of that stuff. So we weren't made to think about it. And um, to me, it was, again, it was a mix of learning from the people who did understand animals and combining that knowledge with the scientific knowledge that I had and how to approach a scientific problem that really made me see the whole picture, which I didn't think I saw before. And so then, then when I started thinking about it and thinking about the mental lives of animals, that began to fascinate me. And I said, I really need to learn more about this. And then I started just on my own, just learning about what people were doing in that area. So I read a lot of work by Franz de Waal, um, working at Emory with the bonobos and the chimps and studying their behavior and um, their societies. And then getting involved in understanding dog behavior and cat behavior. And so that became my new fascination. So my approach now, getting back to your original question as to what I do, I'm really interested in the welfare of animals and, to, and learning about what their needs are in a laboratory setting and how we can improve their lives in the, in the short run while we're still trying to find these better ways of learning about human disease. 
animals will never be a perfect model for humans. I think we all understand that, but they're the best we have at the moment because we can't experiment on humans. And understanding um, the, the understanding how an animal can be the best model, both from a scientific perspective, um, are, are the um, are the mechanisms by which a disease is occurring in an animal similar enough to humans to warrant it to be a model? Or is there a better model? Or can we get some more background information using human cells and culture? Um, and I think all of those things are being done. And I think the, the pharmaceutical industry probably has a real handle on that because they understand, they understand from... Um, you know, a, a bottom line issue that they have to get the most effective ways of coming up with new drugs. And so necessity is the mother of invention. And oftentimes I think that if the government felt that way about um, being a bit more progressive about the kinds of models that we're using, that they would put more money into funding alternatives. Alternatives being all three R's. So working with the animal models in the way we need to be using them, but also putting money into these new and innovative methods for studying human systems. Now we're going to hear a talk at this meeting um, by uh, Dr. Ingver about trying to put a human on a chip. And these are just cutting edge ways of looking at what's going on in a human. And so there are different organs on a chip now, human organs on a chip, lung, kidney, liver. And then someday they're going to have a whole human on a chip where all of these systems are going to be integrated in a really tiny amount. On a chip? On a chip. It's fascinating. And like I said, it's Necessity is the mother of invention. The reason that these many of these d new methods are being developed um, have their basis in bioterrorism, of all things. So we want to know how we can deal with a bioterrorist attack. Well, you can't give, you can't do a clinical trial of a drug for a bio for a bioterrorism agent. You can't go to humans to test that. So you have to use the best, what we think is the best animal model. FDA has the animal rule that says that you have to show that a drug is going to be effective in the best animal model possible before we can approve it for use on a human because we're not going to test it in a human. We can't test it in a human. So we have to develop better human systems to see if these countermeasures are going to be um, effective in humans and effective and safe in humans. I mean, when I think about how far we've come just in what we're able to do in our, with our computers and our cell phones and all those other things, um, now we've got the human genome that's uh, been sequenced and being used routinely so that down the line, we're going to have individualized medicine, and it's already being done. Sequencing the genome of a tumor is becoming commonplace now. And I mentioned my husband with his blood disease. They're going to be sequencing his DNA to see what exactly what mutations are in there. And maybe there's a drug that can be tailored to uh, treat him that would target um, the gene that's causing the most problems. Um, so I see that happening. I think things are developing in a parallel way on many different fronts. And so I think 10 years from now, things will be very different from what they are now. And in 20 years, we may still be using animals for very complex systems like neuroscience and certain physiological questions. And um, I think those things are going to be very difficult to model. Uh, in cell culture or uh, other non-animal, non-systemic methods. But I think we're going to have a lot of answers. 
um, that, that will be coming forward. I mean, some of the things that do concern me um, are public attitudes toward science and the fact that we don't have a good public support for what we do. The fact that people can make statements that are outright lies and nobody calls them on it. The fact that we can't get the public behind something like climate change that is just so obviously happening. Um, and without public support for science, you know, the, the funds at NIH and all of the other funding agencies are just going to decrease and that's just going to limit our abilities to come up with new discoveries. So there has to be, so that's, you know, back to my interest in public communication of science, I think the public has to understand what science does and why it does it and what benefit it can bring to society as a whole. And uh, in order to get their, their backing. And we live in really a, a, a disturbingly scientifically ignorant society. And it's very, very disturbing um, to me to, um, you know, I, I feel like I live in a bubble because all the people I, I converse with and all the people that I meet are, are very well educated. But try going someplace into rural America and they're still going to be believing in crazy things. What, what do you think is an answer to this? Well, I think the scientific community, and I've always gotten on this soapbox too, I think the scientific community owes it to itself to get out there and talk about what they do. And yet, it's not a career that lends itself to doing that. It, it, it takes enormous concentration and focus on very specific and complicated research problems. So one way to do it is to train people in both science and communication so that they can bridge the gap between the scientists and the general public. So I think that's a tremendous um, vocation. A friend of mine is a science writer and I remember giving, I gave a, a lecture in her course a couple of years ago and that was on my soapbox talking about that, that we needed people to really understand the science and the communication piece to get out there and, and really, but, but understand how to reach the public. That to me is the biggest challenge of all and I think you need to be a psychologist and you need to be a sociologist and you know I think we're, we're not equipped we have to, to, to deal with the issue. We have to be more integrative in, in our approaches to things. So while this is an era of focus and specialization I think we're seeing it in medicine where people are going back to more generalized things. I think we need to have people go back to more generalized um, professions that they understand a little bit of everything so that they can be the communicators out there and, and really try to bring the word um, and, and get public support.